Stranger and friend, in challenge and summer. 
Jesus, we are here. We are here for you. Amen.
Stewardship Sunday, Dave, when we uh, dedicate our pledges uh, in a little bit, we'll uh, say some more about um, Stewardship Sunday and what this day means uh, in the life of the church. Uh, and uh, as I was thinking about today, I uh, realized uh, this is the first Stewardship Sunday that I've ever had uh, that Phil Starr, our business manager, has missed. Okay. <laughs> So I have to take advantage of that and say to you, I don't want you to pledge your money today. I can say that because Phil's not here. He would, yes. he would run up front to say that. I want you to pledge yourself. I want you to pledge yourself to make a difference in the world. Sometimes in the ritual of the church, you know, there are just those phrases that kind of uh, stick out in your mind. And, and one of those uh, is when we have weddings here. And so many people have uh, made commitments uh, in this place, on this spot, of a variety of things. To raise their children in the Christian faith, to um, be a solution to human loneliness for one another. Uh, many people have been ordained in this church, and they've been right here on this spot. One of the vows that always strikes me is when we begin a wedding ceremony, we always have them say, I give myself to you to be your wife. I give myself to you to be your husband. And it reminds us that life is all about what you give yourself to. Your family, your faith, your community. Think about the pledges that make people and the government make to their nation. We love the communion song. I give myself away so you can use me. And people sing that with all their heart. And that's a wonderful thing. And the reason why we have this special Sunday is to remember who we are before God. And the heart of stewardship is to know that Adam, the human, is created to tend the garden that God has made. In uh, a, a, a book titled The Steward, a biblical image come of age. It says that perhaps the lost dimension of faith in our time is to understand that God gives us everything. That everything that we have is God's. And we receive it to use it wisely in the ways that would honor God. Parables of Jesus, many, about workers in the vineyard and faithless. So one thing I want to especially communicate to you today is that, you know what? It feels good to do good. And in many areas of the life of our church, we try to bring people along into mission and into ministry. Now, you know, most of us are kind of reticent to volunteer for things. When we began North Street Mission a couple of years ago, uh, we considered how do we get people to try it? You know, it's kind of like that. What oh, was a kid that wouldn't eat a cereal in the morning? Mike, Mike, he hates everything. <laughs> Sometimes in our world today, we have these patterns, right? And we have to interrupt these patterns, and we have to interrupt our thoughts that aren't helpful. Partly, sometimes nobody's ever right. We just don't know that it feels good to do good. Sometimes we're just reluctant. But our business is about helping people to experience service. A few years ago, we, uh, after a wedding here, um, someone who was cleaning up gave me three offering envelopes like we have in the pews, you know, there are these uh, envelopes, there was nothing in them, 
except writing on the outside. And I want to read to you what was written on the outside of these envelopes from someone who attended a wedding here. And it motivated me. It said things like, try donating to a real cause like starving children instead of a building that's empty six out of seven days a week. This building isn't starving like some children who might need two dollars a little more than you do, and more than this building. Try donating to cause someone to to a cause for someone who needs it, not just to heat an uninhabited building. So someone kind of took the time and the thought to write these notes on these cards. First of all. They didn't look into the ministry of our church, right? And they didn't know what we do and what we try to do in the community. But I take our faithfulness to the use of our resources seriously. But sometimes we fight against the stereotype of the church. But the world expects us and holds us to live in the standard of the Spirit of Jesus. And this is an expectation that we find pretty prominently in our culture. And, you know, somebody could write this on Facebook or they could send it to me in email, and they do. But we have to live up to the calling that we say we're found. You need to know that long before I came here, Trinity had established a policy that 20% of our budget would be mission. I've never been in church that did that. I, I'm trying to get people to move into giving and generosity, but I've never, never heard of that. Because that's a fantastic thing, 20%. And that does not include all the other things that we do. It doesn't include anything in the breakfast program. It doesn't include Back Bay or Pine Ridge or the benevolence of our women's group. It doesn't include Esperanza. It doesn't include our youth trips. It doesn't include when we build a house with Habitat. It doesn't include people to people. All the things that we do at every woman's house, Mocha house. It doesn't include any of that. And so a few years ago, we uh, tried to figure out how much that is. And it's impossible for us to know the extent of the mission that goes on here beyond what we do on Sunday morning. Uh, Nairi Karjan, our uh, new association's general minister of Living Waters, uh, Northeastern Ohio Association, was here last Sunday, and she drew attention to a stained glass window with the uh, hourglass uh, on, on the window right there. And that a uh, stained glass window was especially made to help us to remember a principle that was in place in the Evangelical and Reformed Church. And that, and I actually worked with a pastor in my, in my early days at seminary, and he talked about the three-legged stool. And I heard this time and again from people who grew up in the Evangelical and Reformed tradition. It's our time, it's our talent, it's our treasure. I want to tell you that every week, we have at least 45 volunteers who work here from the congregation and from the community every week. And they put in well over 100 hours of labor to provide service for poverty and for the records program. I don't know anybody else who does that. So we hear the punchline in 1 Timothy 6.18. This is the punchline for today. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. I saw a video one time uh, of uh, Cyril Hartman who went to Africa. Uh, he was uh, a missionary to the Ohio Conference from, from Africa. And he would show a video of their worship services. And in their worship services, they had a hollow log up front. And everyone had coins. They didn't have paper money. They had coins. And they brought a lot of coins to worship. And so during the offering, there was a song. And everyone would make the offering up front. And they would dance. 
And so there were these uh, dances that went through. And as the people came up to the, uh, the hollow altar, they would take their coin, they would slam it down on the, on the wood, and it would make a sound. And they did it so quickly that as people followed through, it was kind of like a little rhythm that they were making on the wood. And they were so happy that they brought a lot of coins because they only put one coin down when they went around. And they would go back around in a circle and they would come back up again. And they would slam their coin down on that hollow altar because they were so happy to be involved with a group of people who were making a difference in the world. And they were offering their gifts in gratitude to God. Paul's lists of the gifts of the Spirit include generosity and joy. And our spiritual life isn't complete until we have those things. In fact, Paul said, God loves a hilarious giver. So what did the widow give today in our story? Two copper coins. No, that's not what she gave. Jesus said she gave everything because she gave herself. She was the gift. The gift represented her. Now there are times in life when we have to choose what we will give ourselves to. And as I look out today, I've seen many of you who've been here and who've been here, and you made choices about what you were giving yourself to. But we are defined by the things that we dedicate our life to. Feels good to do good. You benefit from it. This is science, this is psychology, this is religion, this is social theory. It feels good to be able to give. It feels good to be a part of something larger than ourselves. So I'm not much one to keep stats or keep track of things like that because I don't think we ought to look back. We ought to look ahead. We ought to think about what we can do. But one thing I do keep track of, uh, and I believe in it, is one of my missions is to get as many people as I possibly can to go to Mexico with us and experience the ministry of building houses in underserved communities in Mexico, Colonia. Now there are youth who go with us each summer to this mission field. And there is no way that we can calculate the effect of that trip on the quality of their lives. No one can number what happens in their hearts and their minds when they experience those things. One of the great things I think that's happened in the last eight years is that we have this wonderful growing relationship with the College of Worcester, with the breakfast program house, and with the students that we take on spring break uh, down to Tijuana. And we have to ask ourselves, what is the ongoing value of what they get out of those trips and what they learn there? How can we calculate the decades that they will be out in the world with this knowledge about what it feels like to serve? And that experience keeps paying forward when they have children, when they become part of a faith community, when, they're, when they have a career and they go out into the world, and the best thing that we can do is to inspire people by our example and to provide them with a positive vision of the world. <coughs> because God knows there are so many negative visions of the world out there. So Jesus, one of his large miracles was the feeding of the 5,000. Now this is significant because it's the only miracle of Jesus that is told by all four gospel writers. 
It was so important for them that people know that Jesus had compassion and that he believed in feeding people. It has come to be a symbol for us of communion. Now when we take communion, it's not a private, personally spiritual celebration. Communion is a sign for the world. It's an action that reminds us over and over again to share our bread. Because this was the intention of Jesus in the creation of the church. To continue God's mission in the world. Jesus didn't make the kinds of distinctions that we make in the world. And about the crowds that gathered around him. He didn't ask the disciples to go around and look at their ID. He didn't ask them about their marital status. He didn't require drug testing. He didn't separate the Samaritans from the Jews. He didn't verify that they were in fact a member of the church. People were hungry for God and for grace, and so Jesus fed them. And not only that, Jesus asked the disciples that helped him in this mission, and he led them into it. Only the church can do that. Only in the church can you find connections with people who are so different from your ordinary life, you would never come to know any other way. Look at all the people you've come to know since you've been a part of the church. The people that you've come to admire. The people that you know uh, details of their life about little things they do to make the world better for other people. We have to see it to be it. This old world could have so much, but we settle for so little. We could have so much, but we settle for so little. We have to choose faith over fear. We have to choose community over isolation. We have to choose something that's very difficult for us. We have to choose to be challenged rather than to be comfortable. And outside of this world's economy, we all have another identity, and that is we are all children of God. Don't tell Phil that this morning I got up here and said, don't pledge your money. <laughs> pledge yourself. Make a commitment to pay attention to spiritual things. Because there's a huge return on that investment. Not just in a self-interested way, but in a worldly way. So find your calling in the thing that makes you come alive. Jesus picked up those two words from Micah 6, 8. Do justice of kindness while humbly. So give yourself to God's vision of the world, to God's, to God's work in the world, of justice, of mercy, and the dignity of human life. In our private dreams and in our individual callings, we also have to share this common vision. And we all have to have a broader vision of the common good and the way that we are all connected. And I remember today people who gave themselves to their career because through it they knew they were contributing to the common good. Mary Ann Bailey, she had a fantastic career in nursing at uh, Worcester Hospital. I remember attending, uh, she won the Athena Award one year. She was director of nursing. And she did things there motivated by her faith and by this vision of the way things can be. This week we celebrated the life of Ruth Tishman. 
Ruth felt she had a calling to be a teacher. She taught. There are all these people out there that were influenced by her. But you know what? There was something deeper going on there. She was motivated by her faith to create this world and to work for the common good. Ed Shirk. Ed Shirk was a contractor. But I'll tell you what, he was here all the time fixing things. As you're looking up here, a lot of the stuff that's up here, Ed Shirk made it. Because he not only was in the business of building homes, he was in the business of faith and being motivated by faith and goodwill. Now, we are stronger in a faith tradition. Proverbs says, A single arrow is easily broken, but not ten in a bundle. It also says in our wisdom tradition, Two are better than one. If one falls down, someone is there to help them up. Have you ever fallen down? Everybody's had trauma. I remember I had a traumatic experience in kindergarten. Actually, kindergarten itself was a traumatic experience. <laughs> you know what I mean. But I, I remember one of the first days I went to kindergarten, there was this kid that, you know, had, had, that was laying on the ground. You know, he goes, here, help me up. He, you know, like that. So I said, okay. So I helped him up, and I didn't know it was a trick. So that he used the momentum that you were pulling him up with to push you down on the other side. Some of you probably have all had these experiences where someone has betrayed a trust or caused you uh, not to want the help because there's a personal um, risk involved anytime we help someone. And I thought to myself that it took me a while to wonder about this. You know, why would somebody do something like that? That was my thought. And then I asked the question, what kind of a world is this anyway? You know what? I'm still asking that question. What kind of world is this anyway? Why can't we work for the good of the people we live with? When did having compassion become controversial and countercultural? When did we become so cynical? There's a reason that Jesus sends us out two by two. Some conclusion that the defining moment of our lives comes when we find a purpose that we give ourselves to with heart, mind, soul, strength. Pay attention to spiritual matters. Because there is a huge return on that investment for all of us. She put in more than all the others. She gave herself. Don't pledge your money. Pledge yourself. Amen. As we uh, move into our offering time, uh, or into our time of prayer, uh, we're going to use the song I Can Only Imagine as we bring our gifts up in a little bit. Um, but uh, during our prayer time, I have these concerns. Um, pray for my friend Charles Griffith. He's back in the hospital in uh, Canton, uh, so think about him. Uh, also, uh, pray for Jennifer Seaman, who uh, fell on the ice. Uh, and kind of was shaken up. There was nothing broken, but uh, pretty sore, so pray for Jennifer Seaman. Uh, and also Josh Haney uh, reminded me his birthday Saturday. So what what number is it, John? 33. 33? All right. Any other concerns? Um, prayers for Orville family, Catherine and Jeremy Carpenter, as they um, prepare end-of-life stages for their Saturday. Yeah, seven-year-old. Seven-year-old, and his name's Sawyer. Sawyer Carpenter. Sawyer at the Carpenter Bank. Yeah. Um, just 
two things. One, prayers for our veterans. Veterans Day is a big trigger for a lot of people with PTSD. Um, veterans Day is tomorrow. So, and then um, a joy that um, I accepted a position with the VA. As Nancy you know, has uh, received a chaplaincy at the VA uh, and, uh, up, up in uh, Wake Park. And uh, so think about all the work that happens for us. this world 
and all of its delicate balances, that it might be a place of blessing for all people. We pray for the family in Orville, the Carpenter family, as they spend time with their young son Sawyer. We ask that you might bless them and help them to feel your presence with them in a difficult time. As we observe Veterans Day tomorrow, help us to remember those people who made commitments that have changed their lives. We ask that you be with Nancy at the VA and for all those people who continue to work with veterans after their service. We ask that they might find peace and resolution. Be with us today as we think about Mark and as we think about those people who are going through difficult times. Because our world can be so confusing and there seem to be so many answers. We ask that you might be with us and all the people that we've thought about that are in need of healing. Watch over Jennifer, Charles. Continue to think about uh, those places in this world where uh, people are suffering innocently. We pray for the world and for all those in it. We ask that you help us to have eyes to see and to be creative in our wisdom of bringing about change. Thank you for all those people who have been a light for us, who in some way, in their nature, in their career, have been an inspiration for us. And there have been so many. Help us to realize uh, the sense of, with a sense of gratitude those people who have helped us to become who we are today. We give you thanks for the amazing people who built this place, brick by brick. For all those who contributed to the ministry, they've made what we have today possible. Help us to live in your spirit and to do those things that make for a better world. We remember that when your son came into the world, he, he knew what would happen from that day on and how that word would spread and change the world. We pray that we might continue to be a faithful part of that movement that Jesus began so long ago in a place like this. And we remember that when he talked to the disciples about prayer, he said, anytime you gather together, you should always say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we uh, move into our um, pledge of dedication and our offering, um, on uh, Stewardship Sunday, we have something of a uh, table offering, and uh, we, um, we do that in the same way that we take communion up front, uh, and uh, people will begin uh, in the front and uh, come forward down both sides of the table, and you can place your uh, pledge card in the basket uh, and an offering into the plates as you go through, and then as you go around down the end, uh, hopefully you'll end up in the same place that you are right now, uh, and you'll find your, you'll find your seat. Uh, as we take this offering, we remember that uh, all of our offerings are to God, because we realize they come from God. We thank uh, Doug Patton for providing our special music for our place dedication Sunday. <laughs> Yeah, and this special music is because Phil Starr's not here. So you don't have to pledge anything? Is that right? <laughs> Phil was actually going to sing this. Thank you. 
following Christ will change your life. Stand up for fairness, truth, and kindness. God's love is not only for us, but for everyone. Give yourself away so God can use you. 